Hello everyone, this is Mota Mosby and I know that you might be surprised. Uh, your playlist didn't get mixed up. You are listening to the same podcast, Gerda Atash, around the bonfire in English. I know I just made two promises when I started this podcast. One of them was to only produce content in Persian. And the other one was to provide the links to the sources that I use. Though there were only two promises that I made, I failed to keep one of them. Sorry for that. But I promised to make a summary of this episode in Persian in the following weeks. This is an interview with Dr. Michael Roos. Dr. Roos is the professor of philosophy and the director of the program in the history and philosophy of science at Florida State University, or was, because this interview is exactly after his retirement, if I have gotten him correctly. All these episodes that I have re uh, released, they focused on nutrition and fitness. How is an interview with a professor of philosophy related to our other podcast? Well, I didn't promise that all my episodes are going to be related to one another, but this one is related. In order to understand where we lost our health and we started to become sicker and sicker, it is important to know the Darwinian theory of evolution and to make a distinction between progress and evolution and know that these things are not exactly the same. I will just tell you the short story of how I got to know Dr. Roos. It was through one of his articles. In, it was around 2012 when Kave Behbahani, my friend and my then philosophy teacher, approached me and asked me for a translation of an article. I asked about the topic and he said it's about evolution. I said, of course, I would love to do it because I am fascinated about evolution. I look at everything through the lens of empiricism and evolution. And this is in line with uh, the quote that Dr. Roos uses in his signature. Nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is such an essential theory to make sense of the world and the things that are happening around us. The title of the, the article was The Philosophy of Evolutionary Theory. As I was translating this article, I got to know I got to better know the distinction between progress and evolution. It got me thinking, and this is no exaggeration, that every paradigm shifting idea I've gotten to know or anything that has changed my life has been informed by this thought that we have not necessarily progressed. The fact that we have evolved does not necessarily mean that we have become better beings in every respect. That is why I was eager to have an interview with Dr. Roos and he kindly agreed to it and finally we had the interview last night. Uh, there were some difficulties. I, uh, my, my email 
ended up in his spam folder when we were trying to arrange uh, the interview when I was trying to send him the link. So, uh, it, but eventually we managed to do it. Um, and at some point in the interview, he refers to contraception and how that might not be a popular topic in Poland. If you are living outside Poland, you might not be aware of the decision that the government has made recently to effectively make it impossible to carry out an abor abortion. So, uh, this is the uh, when he talks about con contraceptions and how they might not be very popular. Uh, not be a very popular topic here is referring to this issue and the ongoing protest protests that i hope are going to be fruitful i hope you enjoy this interview if you do so please share it with your friends like us on youtube or if you are listening to the podcast leave a review on iTunes or if it is possible for you that would be very nice if you could support me on Patreon. Without further ado let's get to the conversation I had with Dr. Roos. Okay we have started the recording please. Right. Uh, okay let's talk then about all of my articles. I, I don't want to say every last one that I've ever written but I would say that there's a linking theme toward to everything, more or less everything that I've written, and uh, it, it's it's variations on the theme. Uh, the uh, historian of ideas, Sir Isaiah Berlin, spoke of two kinds of thinkers: the hedgehog and the fox. The fox is somebody who looks at all sorts of different ideas, you know, one after another in different areas. The hedgehog is somebody who's got one idea, but then spends their time, as it were, unraveling it. Well, in many respects, I'm a hedgehog. Uh, that doesn't mean to say I don't cover a lot of items, but mainly I would say the items I cover do tend to be linked by a common theme or a common center core or whatever whatever you trunk if you want to call it whatever you want to call it and obviously where i'm starting is with darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection now at one level i'm dealing obviously with the modern theory which is genetics molecular biology and all of those sorts of things however i'm a uh, I was, I started in the 1960s when Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions was very, very influential. Do you know that book? Uh, no, not, unfortunately not. Okay, it was a book written by a man who is a historian in the 1960s called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And okay, hold on, it says open, expanding your, for some reason, uh, uh, there we are. I've got you. Is he an anarchist? What? Is he an anarchist? I don't know, but let, let me keep going. Let me keep talking. You can hear me and you're recording. Okay. So, what Thomas Kuhn said was if you want to understand science today, then you've got to know something about the history of science. In other words, you can't just, as it were, take a, a slice from today and just analyze it that way and think you can find everything. You've got to dig down into the history. Now, I was working on evolutionary theory and the whole point of working on evolutionary theory is to tell you that if you want to understand the present, you have to understand the past. So obviously I'm working in the field of ideas rather than the field of organisms. But for me, that was a very attractive idea that in order to do good philosophy of science, I had to dig back into the history of science. So I spent a lot of time in my early career 
retraining as a historian of, of science, historian of biology. In fact, I spent a year at Cambridge University pretty much all the time in the Darwin archives. They've got all Darwin's papers there, studying it and learning all about it. And so this very much has been the approach that I've taken to doing the uh, philosophy of science, even to this day. If I want to understand anything, I start with Darwin. Uh, I mean, I think Darwin's, I mean, I, I think Darwin's a very great scientist, but I'm starting with Darwin just be, not because it, he's Darwin, but because I think his theory of evolution is the starting point for where we ha have to go to look at modern evolutionary theory. Darwin wasn't the first person to have evolution, but I think it's fair to say that Darwin's book in 18, 1859 was the, as it were, the core work that led to modern evolutionary thinking. And as I'm sure you know, what Darwin's theory says is, he starts with Malthus, many more organisms are born that can survive and reproduce. So there's going to be what Malthus called a struggle for existence, but really it's as much a struggle for reproduction. So some organisms are going to breed, some won't. And what Darwin says is the success on average, on average, is going to be a function of the different characteristics that the winners have from the losers, or what Darwin calls, <coughs> excuse me, the fitter from the less fit. And then Darwin also said, and he, he didn't really know why, but he said there seems always in a population to be new variations coming into it. And so over time, you get a, <coughs> a natural form of selection analogous to the form of selection that breeders have. When breeders want, what should we say, fatter cows, then they choose the fat, you know, the fat calves, and they breed from those and eat the thin ones. And so over the, or if you want sh sheep with bigger fleeces, then you breed from the sheep with big fleeces and, you know, eat or throw out the ones with, with small fleeces. And so this is artificial selection. And what Darwin said is you're going to get a natural form of this in nature. But this doesn't just lead to change. It leads to change of a particular kind. It leads to change where you get the hand or the eye and they are as if designed and you can use them. They, I mean, in other words, the hand isn't just a hand. A hand is for grasping things. And you see, you see I put on my spectacles. So in other words, a hand is a tool that I use that makes me more efficient. And if I can see better, then I'm going to do better in the struggle for existence than if I'm blind. Except, of course, if I'm living in a cave where you can't see anything anyway, and then that's a different matter. But out here, we're better if we can see things than otherwise. And so what Darwin said is the reason why we have eyes is because those organisms which did have eyes were better in the struggle for existence than those which weren't. And over time, this leads to change at what Darwin called the tree of life. So you get things. And then what Darwin does is he says, but the interesting thing is, this isn't just a theory about reproduction. This is a theory that you can apply to all the life sciences. So if you want to understand, let's say, the fossil record, uh, am I, I'm not muted, no. Uh, if you want to understand the fossil record, which starts with primitive forms and then works up to fairly sophisticated forms, then you think of it in terms of evolution rather than in terms of God saying, bam, here's, you know, here's a fish. Okay, bam, here's a reptile, a bit higher. Bam, here's, no, says Darwin, no, you got your fish, there we are, and they're reproducing like this, and then the good ones become reptiles, and then they, the reptiles, and the good ones become mammals, and the good ones become apes, and the really good ones become humans, humans and the super, very, very good ones become Englishmen. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Darwin certainly thought that. <laughs> anyway, 
so that's one example. Or the one that Darwin liked was geographical distribution, or what is known as biogeography, where <coughs> Darwin went to the Galapagos Archipelago, this group of islands in the Pacific, and there he found that there were different birds and different tortoises on different islands. And Darwin said, why is this? Did God so love the Galapagos that boom, he put one species here and boom, he put another species here and boom. No, no, says Darwin. They came from the mainland, from South Africa. And then when they got there, they move every now and then they go to a different island and they breed separately. And this made for different species. So this was the argument that Darwin used right through the origin. So this is Darwin's theory. Now, the big problem that Darwin had was he didn't have a, a theory of heredity. He didn't know exactly why things get passed on or why new variations come into, into the population. And so that was, if you like, the missing element. Now we know at the same time that Darwin was working, a monk, Moravian monk in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Gregor Mendel, was in fact discovering this. Although very interestingly, Mendel never ever thought that the work he was doing would be to, as it were, solve Darwin's problems. Mendel, when, it, when uh, the origin was translated into German, of course, Mendel living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire was, was German speaking and so could read German. He got very early on, a year or two after the origin came out, Mendel got a copy of the origin. And we've still got Mendel's copy that he wrote in the, in the notes. And never once, never once did Mendel say, ah, I can solve this problem. What Mendel was interested in, he was a Catholic priest. And so what he was interested in was, could he, as a Catholic priest, accept evolution, which obviously goes against Genesis written literally. And at the end, Mendel said, yes, I can. So Mendel said, yes, I can accept evolution quite comfortably. But Mendel never ever said, ah, I see the problem that Darwin's got and I've got the solution. Never got that, never got that. Uh, Darwin never met Mendel, but we think possibly Mendel went to a conference in England in 1861. And it's quite possible that Darwin was up on the podium, up on the, you know, the speaker's thing. Now, Darwin would not have spoken to Mendel and Mendel would not have spoken to Darwin. But it, I, I, one has no reason to think that Darwin ever met Mendel. Quite possible that Mendel actually went to a conference where he saw Darwin. We, we're not sure of that. But we, as I say, we certainly know that Mendel had a copy of, of The Origin of Species and wrote all over, all, all over it about whether or not a, a priest could accept him. Um, so as, as I'm sure you know, it wasn't till about 1900 when people had a much better grasp of psychology of the nature of the cell that people recognized Mendel's work for what it was. Oh God, I lost, you've lost me again. Now, why is that? No, no, no. Uh, I, I, I can hear you. You can hear me. Well, yeah. yes, I'd like to see you too. Uh, I'm not sure why I can't see you. Can I, uh, oh, oh. Can you uh, see me now? No, I'm just trying to see. Hold on. No, no, I can't. I don't know why I can't see you. No, ah, oh, quirky. No, you, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Okay, well, as long as you can see me, that's what really counts. Okay, yes. so, so as I'm saying, what happened was that about 1900, people started to discover Mendel <coughs> as a proper theory of, of heredity. Although at first, people thought it was a rival to Darwin rather than something which fit into Darwin, a compliment to Darwin. And so it wasn't until about 1930 that we got what is known as the modern theory of evolution or the synthetic theory of evolution, where Mendelism and Darwin Darwinian selection are put together. And then, of course, the final big breakthrough came in 1950, <coughs> excuse me, in 1953, 
when Watson and Crick discovered the double helix and showed that the, Men <coughs> that the Mendelian gene can in fact be explained in terms of molecules. It took, you know, 10 or more years for that start to start to infiltrate into evolutionary thinking. But certainly today, evolutionists are quite happy with molecular biology. It's part, it's part, of, the, part of the picture. Now, let me finish what I'm saying with this. Mm -hmm. I'm a philosopher. So in a way, there's two kinds of questions I'm going to ask. One is philosophical questions about the theory. Is, for instance, is the theory a theory like the theory of physics? Or is it in some sense different? And I've done a lot of work on that, including my book, my recent book, On Purpose, where I argue <coughs> that yes, in many respects, Darwinian theory is like a theory of physics, but it's different in one respect because it's what we call teleological or final causes. Evolutionists, Darwinians, can ask what is the purpose of something? If you do physics, final causes, as they're called, they're excluded from physics. Everybody, you can discuss why the moon goes round the, round the Earth. Why doesn't the moon fly off into space? And you can talk about why this happens because of gravity and all of these sorts of things. But you don't ask why, what's the purpose of the moon? What's the function of the moon? I mean, a joke is the moon exists in order to light the way home for drunken philosophers at the end, at the end of the day. But that's a joke, not physics. But in biology, you can ask these questions. You've got, let's say, you've got something sticking out in the middle of your face, your nose. Now, I can ask you, or I can ask generally, not necessarily you, why does one have a nose? What is the purpose of the nose? Can't ask, what is the purpose of the moon? But I can ask, what is the purpose of the nose? And as we know, the purpose of the nose is okay. to smell. In other words, it's one of the five senses that we have. So Darwinism, as I say, this is the kind of philosophical question that I'm particularly interested in, is questions like, is Dar Darwinian theory like uh, Newtonian physics. Now, you might say, well, you don't need to know history to do that. Because if you understand the problems as Darwin saw the problems, then you get much more rapid insight into what the problem is and how Darwin solved it. <clears throat> and then you can ask questions like, is this exactly the same problem today? And I would say, yes, it is. Do we solve it in exactly the same way? And I'd say often we do, but sometimes we have much more sophisticated understanding. And so we can offer explanations that perhaps Darwin wouldn't have been able to offer. So yes, it's the same problem, but today it, often it's done in a very much more sophisticated way. So that's one kind of problem that I'm interested in. The other kind of problem is as a philosopher, how can I use evolutionary theory, and in particular, Darwinian evolutionary theory, in order to explain um, evolutionary, I'm sorry, philosophical problems? And what are, the, what are the two big philosophical problems? Well, you were in Germany, and you know, Immanuel Kant said, it's the question of the starry heavens above and the moral law in, in within. In other words, the two big questions of philosophy is what can I know? What can I know about the world? And the second question is what should I do? What ought I to do? In other words, what philosophers call epistemology on the one hand and ethics on the other. And in recent years, I've written quite extensively on this, particularly in the context of ethics and trying to understand why Darwinian theory would be important to understanding questions about what we should do. And I start with the premise that the most important thing we know about human beings is that we were not in fact created by a good God on the sixth day, but that we, uh, we evolved through evolution. So we're modified, we're modified monkeys rather than as Thomas Henry Huxley said, modified dirt or modified mud. Now, I, I don't think that this 
it disproves the existence of God. Of course, it disproves the existence of a literal God of the kind that uh, American creationists like. But I don't think, I, I think most Christians would say, well, Genesis is metaphorical. And if God wanted to create through evolution, that's God's business, not ours. It, our business is to understand how he did it. And so, as I say, I don't find these sorts of things in any sense uh, threatening like that. But I do think it has to be important that we are, in fact, modified monkeys. So what we're going to do and what we feel we ought to do is going to be very much a function of the kind of human beings we are or the kind of organisms that we are. So let me put it this way. If we were, let's say, if we were, well, Darwin says this himself, if we were ants, then as you know, or, or hymenoptera, wasps or bees, if we were ants, then what we know is we'd have a queen in the nest and most of us would be females, workers who are sterile can't have offspring themselves. And what do they do? They spend their time looking after the, the queen, but also raising the offspring. I mean, that's what they do. And then, of course, they also spend time going out of the nest and looking for food, looking for leaves, for instance, that they cut up and bring back into the nest to feed the, the embryos or the, the, the grubs. So this is, what, this is what, let's say, ants do. Well, what about the males? the drones. Well, as we know, the males don't do anything. They just hang around until it's mating time. And then the queen flies up, uh, up into the heavens or the new queen flies up into the heavens and the drones all follow her. And one of them is lucky and fertilizes her, even though it usually means the queen comes back with half his, bo half his body hanging from her. But then what happens as the weather gets colder is that the workers say, we don't need the, the males anymore. They're not doing anything. They're just, uh, they, they're not, you know, they've done their job. We don't need them. So they close the nest and the drones all die. They freeze to death. They'd starve to death. Now, Darwin says, if we were ants, we would think not that we ought to look after each other, but that our highest moral calling could be to kick the males out of the nest when winter comes and let them starve. So in other words, they'd have a completely different moral system. And so these are the sorts of questions that I'm interested in. To what extent is our moral system a function of the kind of way that humans have evolved rather than otherwise? And, and, and without you know, breaking any secrets, what I think is the most important thing is that humans are social, that by and large, we work together and we cooperate. And so this is how we succeed. We're not that strong. We're not that fast. All of these things. But put it together and work as a group. And then we can do things much more efficiently than working singly. For instance, one person on their own is not going to catch a, a deer or a gazelle. However, a group of us who plan, who plot, who set traps and all of these things might well capture the gazelle without too much trouble. But it, it's a group thing. And then, of course, when we've caught the gazelle and killed it, then we don't eat it all ourselves. We have to share it. But that's how humans work. So these are the sorts of problems I work on, although at the moment <clears throat> I'm trying to write a book. I'm writing a book which tries to deal with the question of what happens if you don't cooperate? What happens mm -hmm. if, if you have war, for instance? Or, I mean, obviously, look at Iraq. I mean, the extent to which there's hatred, there's, there's violence, True. there's trouble within the country, uh, people against other people, and then trouble with Iran against Iran mm -hmm. against others, and not just the Americans. And I say, if humans are so very social, if they get on so well together, then how on earth do you get a country like Iran? And I'm choosing Iran. I mean, I could choose America today, so it's not that I'm picking on Iran particularly. But how on earth do you get a country, <coughs> excuse me, like Iran, where you get so little social cooperation, or so it seems, uh, if we are in fact social? So these are some of the sorts of questions I'm interested in and seeing how we can solve them. So that's 
a good background to what I do. So there we are. Mm -hmm. So that's a start. Yeah. Um, actually, you raised a very uh, good point at the end that we are social animals and uh, our survival depends on being social. And the way that uh, our survival depends on, on, on cooperating with one another. Yes. Um, but the way that uh, society has yes. changed and has evolved, um, the ones who do not care about others mostly come on top. And yet this is somehow, from my point of view, uh, in contrast to our nature. What is your view on that? Um, well, obviously, humans are cultural beings as well as just biological beings. And we do do things uh, uh, for our culture. <clears throat> I, if, for instance, it seems that most of the time that human beings, Homo sapiens, was on this earth, let's say from about 300 million years ago to about 15,000 years ago, we were bands of hunter-gatherers. We were small bands, perhaps of 50 people, <coughs> mainly related to each other, who, went, who lived by hunting and by gathering berries and that sort of thing. Now, it was a very big, uh, if we were all in Africa, we weren't necessarily all, but Africa's a hell of a big place. And there weren't a lot of humans. We're, we're talking in total 20, 30,000, not a lot more. So basically, you've got these bands, and obviously, every now and then <clears throat> they would knock up against each other, they would interact. But by and large, they didn't. And if they at a band who they didn't find particularly friendly, then they, you know, they'd leave. They'd just get away. There's no point in fighting. You might get hurt. So, as I say, up until about 15,000 years ago, it all worked very well. We're social within our groups. We, we recognize that there are other bands that we might be friendly with or we might not be that friendly with. But by and large, you know, we can go about our own business because there's lots of room for all of us. And then around 15,000 years ago, perhaps a little later, agriculture was invented. And of course, agriculture on the one hand is a terrific success. It means you can feed a lot more people a lot more steadily. So in other words, you have many more babies than you would if you were in a hunter-gatherer society. And so suddenly, 10,000 years ago or so, human population started to grow. And of course, two things. First of all, then there wasn't as much space and we were knocking up against each other. And secondly, with agriculture, you can't get up and leave. With hunter-gatherers, if you're not getting on with your neighbors, well, okay, tomorrow we'll just get up and we'll go 10, 15, 20 miles to the south and <clears throat> we won't bother them and they won't bother us if need be. We've got time, we'll go 50 miles to the south because there's lots of space. But of course, with agriculture, you've put, your, you've, you've put down your uh, crops, you've got your fields, you've looked after your fields, you've got your cattle. You can't, if somebody comes along that you don't like, you can't just get up and say, okay, tomorrow we'll move on. No, because you've got things. So as I say, the feeling is that agriculture changed things very significantly. And of course, this then, it didn't mean immediate genetic changes. There wasn't time for immediate genetic changes, but it did mean that culture started to come in a great deal more. <clears throat> and as I say, there's a feeling that things like uh, race and war and uh, these sorts of things came as a consequence when people, as soon as you've got something, then others can want it. If you're a hunter-gatherer band, the, the next hunter-gatherer band might have a might occasionally have a, a, a dead animal that you want to eat, but by and large, they don't any more than you do. So why go to war with another band when you know what are you going to get out of it? There's nothing. They don't have anything that you can get. Maybe one or two of their women, but not much more than that. Whereas, as I say, when you've got agriculture, then of course it's worth 
going and trying to grab what others have got. And of course, equally, it's worth defending what you've got. And the way you defend is not by leaving, but by fighting back. So as I say, there's a lot of feeling that things like war and conflict and these sorts of things are, as it were, a byproduct of what seems to be a hugely successful move that humans made, namely towards agriculture. But as it were, in this world, you know, everything, every cloud's got a, uh, every silver cloud's got a, a oh, every silver cloud got a dark lining or something like that. Uh, and so um, this is, you know, this is the situation we've got. So these are some of the, as I say, some of the problems, partly philosophical, partly biological, that concern me and that I work on these days. Now, you've got to remember, I'm 80 now, so I don't suppose I'm going to be working on these for a huge lot longer, but that's what I'm working on at the moment. Right. Uh, so uh, considering the positive points about uh, agricultural revolution and the negative points, um, what is your standpoint regarding it? Do you uh, consider it a positive change or a negative change, a progress or a, a move backwards? I don't know. I tend to be a little bit cynical about these things. I mean, obviously, at one level, you get positive change, but then at another level, you get negative change, don't you? I mean, you think about science and technology. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's led to a lot of positive changes. I mean, for instance, that you and I can exactly. converse that you and I can converse today. I mean, you yes. know, we, we couldn't have done this 20, 30 years ago in the way that we're doing, but now we can. Uh, but on the other hand, it leads to all kinds of weaponry and things like that, which we didn't have before. And, you know, to go back to Iran again, think of the kinds of weapons that now can be developed that couldn't be developed 50 years ago. And we all know that one of the big issues is, is nuclear weapons and, you know, the development of nuclear weapons. And we saw what the Americans did in Japan at the end of the Second World War. And it, we're glad to say it's never happened since, but I don't think anybody could guarantee that it will never happen again. I mean, I don't want to pick on Iran particularly. Think of you know, India and Pakistan. Think of South, think of North Korea, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. And anybody who thinks that North Korea doesn't represent a major threat. I mean, they've got atomic weapons and now they've got intercontinental missiles. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they may not get to America, but they could certainly drop one on Japan. Imagine they dropped a, a nuclear weapon on Tokyo, for instance. Well, obviously that would bring an immediate reaction by the Americans who would start bombing the hell out of North Korea, which would mean an immediate reaction by the Chinese. And God knows where we'd be. So the answer to your question is, it, it always seems to me to be one step forward and two steps back. Yes, obviously, things in many respects are better than they were. I mean, I've lived, you know, as I say, for 80 years, and I've been able to live a very comfortable life, thank you. I, I, you know, when I want to go planes, I, places I can get on the, on the plane, I don't have to walk there. Uh, I, 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 my food stuffs, I, I, I have abend, abundant food. Uh, I obviously have good ways of leisure and these sorts of things I can, I have a computer that I can work on. So obviously uh, I, I live in the American South, but I've got sent, I've got air conditioning. So it, in the, in the summer, it's not too hot to do anything, but just sit around. We can cool our houses and just get on with our lives. So obviously at one level, there's been huge amounts of progress. I mean, again, contraception, I know probably mm -hmm. not, a, not a popular topic in, in Poland, <laughs> but certainly, I mean, the, the pill, the birth control pill True. has made a huge difference to the lives of women and freed them from the, the fear of pregnancy. It doesn't mean to say they don't get pregnant, but they can get pregnant much more on their, uh, uh, on their own decision, as it were, yeah, rather, than their, yeah. rather than their biologist decision. So obviously, uh, technology has made a great deal of difference. 
But as I say, there's always the downside, the danger. And of course, not just uh, nuclear weapons, but obviously global warming. We've seen, I mean, why do we have global warming? Because people have automobiles, which, I mean, that's a big problem, which emit all sorts of exhausts, which cause, you know, carbon, carbon in, in the air and, you know, cause, uh, uh, c cause warming from the sun and these sorts of things. Well, obviously, the, this is a downside to what is in many respects huge, you know, progress. Now, it doesn't mean to say we can't do anything about it, but as you can see, the difficulty of getting people to do anything about it is entirely another matter. I mean, America has turned its back on global warming, at least despite the fact that they've had these horrendous uh, uh, forest fires in, in California all summer, despite the fact that where I live in the American South, we have these horrendous tornadoes and hurricanes coming. Uh, so we know that it's causing a problem, and yet our leaders won't do anything about it. So uh, as I see, if you ask me, uh, yes, I mean, I do think there's progress, but do you think that it, it's progress, 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 and progress forever, progress uber alles, as it were? No, I certainly don't. It is, as you said, one step forward, two steps backwards. Okay, what are you saying? Uh, it is, as you mentioned, one step forward, but two steps backwards. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and this is about our story of civilization, how we change after civilization. This is the story of one species and Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, the more radical, uh, I would like to say, idea that I got from your article is that uh, to say that human evolu evolution, I mean, the result of the evolution that led to uh, led into the emergence of humans does not necessarily show that humans are a superior being, that they have progressed over other beings. It is hard to say that uh, we are the perfected forms of our ancestors and we are the perfected forms because of, and because of our intelligence, we are superior to other beings. Well, uh, I, I don't want to speak definitively for, for Islam, but I'd be surprised if it's that different from Judaism and Christianity in that <coughs> clearly Judaism and, and Christianity make humans superior to all other animals. I mean, in Islam too. Gen yes. You know, Genesis talks about humans being, Adam and Eve being created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. uh, now, certainly in the New Testament, we're told, that God cares about all animals, that any bird that falls, God knows about it. But then it's emphasized, we are superior to them. So it is certainly a, a premise, if you like, a, an essential premise of Western religion. And I'm talking now certainly about Christianity and That's Judaism, true. and I suspect very much Islam too, true. that humans are special, that we are, I mean, other, Animals have a place in, in God's, in God's uh, picture, God's world, but they don't rate anything in any way like humans because humans, as they say, are made in the image of God. We are special. So on the one hand, then, you've got the Christian, uh, let's say the Christian position. Then I think you've also got the position of a lot of biologists, uh, for instance, like um, Edward O. Wilson, to take an example, Richard Dawkins too, who believe in biological progress and who believe that in fact, we do see in evolution, uh, an upward climb from the blob through, you know, through, uh, all through fish and then amphibians, reptiles, mammals, apes, higher apes, and finally humans, da dum da dum. And so certainly there's no question that a lot of a lot of scientists, a lot of, of very good evolutionary biologists believe that there is progress and that prog this progress leads ultimately to human beings. Now, 
certainly somebody like Wilson doesn't think you can be complacent because Wilson certainly believes that it's possible for us to decline. I mean, he's worried about things like global warming. And he says, if we don't do something about it, then humans are not going to be as good as they should be. You know, we're, we're just not going to function as well as we could. And maybe there'll be even a reverse evolution. So what Wilson says is we've got to do something about this to keep it up. So it's I mean, I take it the Christian's going to say no matter what, humans are superior, even though we're sinners, we're still superior. Whereas I think somebody like Wilson would say, yes, we are superior, but it's not guaranteed. We've got to keep working to make sure that we stay superior. So I think that's a second position. And then I think there's a third position, which is the one I'm inclined to take. And this fits in very much with what I've been saying to you earlier, that I would want to say that in many, many respects. Oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. I just want to get this. Oh, I see. Yeah, and if you no, it's okay. okay. your monitor uh, so that we have the full, uh, your full face, that would be... No, no. Helpful. Anyhow, what I want to say is, as I was saying about progress earlier, I, yes, humans have evolved, but I'm not sure that we're superior to everything. I mean, let's face up to it. The, the coronavirus, from a biological point of view, is, you know, is winning against humans rather well. I mean, already in America, what is it, 200, nearly 250,000, a quarter of a million people have died from the virus in the first six months of this year. So a bit longer than six months now, but you know, already. Now, that doesn't seem to me as though humans are winning and the virus is losing. I think a good case. So do I want to say the virus is superior to humans? No, of course I don't. But do I want to say biologically, one could make a case for saying this, the virus is superior to humans. And I'm afraid I could say that. Yes, it does seem to me that there's good reason to think that maybe the virus is a more efficient organism than a human. So this is my position. I don't think you can read human superiority out of, out of nature. And I don't believe in the religious side. But I still, obviously, I think that in, in respects, most important respects, humans are superior. But what I want to say is that that's my judgment, not God's judgment, not nature's judgment. It's my judgment. I judge humans to be superior. So I want to say that in a sense, we have to make the decision ourselves. It's us who makes the decision. And that's why, not quite facetiously, I call myself a Darwinian existentialist because the existentialists say you have to choose. It, it, it's not given to you. The choice is yours. Condemned to freedom. Nobody's going to make these choices for you. What's going to happen is the way that you make the decision. Even if God exists, the decision ultimately is yours. And I agree with that very strongly indeed. So that's why I call myself an existentialist, uh, a Darwinian existentialist, because I believe very strongly that the decision is ours and ours alone. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much for the clarifications. How much more time have you got? I could give you another 15 minutes if you like. And that's great. So for, let's go back to uh, when that theory of evolution was born. Uh, yeah. you, you start this uh, article with this quote, Darwinian evolutionary theory is a bastard offspring of Christianity. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. In that, I, <laughs> okay. I, let me speak to that one then. I take it that's what you'd like me to do. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, you see, Thomas Kuhn, I talked about him earlier in this, in this interview, in the structure of scientific revolutions. He's talking about scientific revolutions, going from flat earth to Copernicus, going from Genesis to evolution. So he's talking about that. And what Thomas Kuhn says is that scientific revolutions are rather like political revolutions. What, now you've got, let's say in Russia, 
now you've got the Tsar and royalty and a monarchy, and then you've got communism. You've got Lenin and Marxism and Stalin. And, and so you've got a revolution. And Kuhn says science is a bit like that. And more than that, Kuhn says is it requires a kind of conceptual shift that can't be just reason. You've got to make a kind of commitment. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, that at some level, you've got to say, no, I no longer find the Christian story adequate. So I'm going to take up the Darwinian story. I don't mean, I don't think that that means you stop being a Christian, but I do think it means you stop believe, believing in six days of creation. And Kuhn says, this is something which is a sort of a paradigm switch, he calls it a conceptual shift. And Kuhn says is there's no connection between what goes before and what goes after. And I wrote a book on the Darwinian revolution back in 1979, which on the one hand wanted to say, yes, I think Kuhn's in many respects saying a lot of important things about the nature of change and how it does require a sort of a reconception of the way things are. However, I want to say that certainly in the case of Darwinism, and I suspect in the case of other major scientific revolutions, what Darwin was doing was not so much coming up with something new, but taking what he found already and rearranging it to make a new picture. What I don't know whether you know the word kaleidoscope, but a kaleidoscope mm -hmm. is one of these children's toys where you look down through a, a down through a tube and it's light at the other end and there are lots of bits of confetti and that sort of thing colored confetti and as you turn it it flakes and makes a different picture but it's the same pieces making a different picture and i want to say that scientific revolutions are often like a kaleidoscope where you take what you've got in the past and you rearrange it and make a new picture so what did darwin take well one of the things that darwin took was the Christianity in which he grew up. Not, not Catholic Christianity, but Anglican, Church of England, what Americans call Episcopalian Christianity, which is what he got when he was at school and when he was at university at Cambridge. So in other words, I want to say that what Darwin did was take his Christian background and make a new story out. That's why I call it a bastard offspring. It's not just it's not just exactly the same offspring, it's the, but it is an offspring, but it's, it's, you know, it's a different kind of offspring. So that's why I call it the bastard offspring. So it, it's, a, it's not quite straightforward. And one of the things I talked about teleology and final cause just a moment ago, or just earlier, and the nose. And of course, one of the big things in, certainly in Anglican Christianity, Anglican theology, is what they call natural theology, and in particular, the argument from design or the teleological argument, namely that the world is so design-like, it couldn't have happened by chance. There must have been a cause, namely God. And that's, of course, is what people believed up until Darwin, that the eye and the hand are not just random things, but they're designed and put together so that it work perfectly. They're not just, you know, if. If you don't have any design, you just get a mess. You take, let's say, you come into a room uh, with a bunch of chalks and you throw the chalks on the floor. They're not going to make a pattern or anything like that. They're just going to lie there broken and random. But if you came in and the chalks had been arranged in order to say, let's say they'd been arranged in order to say Iran. So you've got a, one piece of chalk is an eye, then two pieces of chalk to make an A with one, another smaller piece of chalk, you know, to make an A and R, well, okay, one piece of chalk and then two or three pieces of chalk going on and another. And if you saw that, then you'd say, no, people just didn't throw the chalks on the floor. Somebody designed it. Somebody set out to make it say Iran. In other words, if I come in and the chalks are all random on the floor, that there's no reason. I mean, I don't look for any any special reason for that. But if I come in and on the floor, the chalks are spelling out Iran, then I say, aha, somebody did that. And of course, this is the argument from design. 
the nose, the eye, the hand couldn't have happened by chance. So what did cause it? Obviously, God. God made it. But now along comes Darwin and says, no, I don't need God. Natural selection can do it. Just blind laws working indefinitely create design-like phenomena. So in other words, what Darwin's doing is changing the picture entirely from one which demands God to one which doesn't demand God. But the problem he's trying to solve is the same problem. He's trying to solve the problem of why the eye and the hand aren't just random, they look designed. So this was what I was saying when I said Darwinism, if you like, is a bastard offspring of Christianity. It's not a straight, a straight offspring would be say, well, obviously Christianity is an offspring of Judaism. Mm -hmm. And clearly the Jews had the argument from design, Con consider the heavens, you know, the, uh, uh, you know the, in all their glory. I mean, you get the argument from design in the Psalms of David. So you've got the problems there. And then Christianity takes them over. But I wouldn't want to say that Christianity is a bastard offspring of, of, of Judaism. I mean, may, perhaps some people would, but I'd say, no, it's pretty clearly an offspring of Judaism. And I suspect you pro people would want to say something along the same lines about Islam. It, yes. it, didn't come out, it didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a background. It came out of a background, ultimately, of the Jewish picture. But obviously, the Muslims think that there's things to be added to it, namely the arrival of Muhammad and all of these sorts of things. So again, you've got a flow. But in the case of Darwinism, Darwin wants to break, he wants to keep the problem, but he wants to say no. God, I mean, he's not saying no God exists. He's not saying that. He's not even saying God didn't design it. What he's saying is God didn't have to design it by hand, as it were, right there, as somebody would have to design that chalks on the floor spelling out Iran. To see the chalks on the floor spelling out Iran had to be somebody planning that and doing it. And Darwin says, that's what I'm denying, that the eye, the hand, the nose needs somebody actually planning that and doing that. No, I think it can all be done through blind law without God interfering. Maybe God set the laws going in the first place. I don't want to deny that, but certainly we don't need God, as it were, designing these things. So that's what I mean by a bastard offspring. What I'm saying, and of course, in a way, then I'm different from Kuhn. I want to say Kuhn's obviously right in saying it's a different perspective, a different way of looking at things. Where Kuhn's wrong is to say there's no continuity between before the revolution and after the revolution. There is a lot of continuity, and in particular, in Darwin's case, a continuity of similar problems. And so this is, this is why I say that Darwinism is a bastard offspring. Again, the tree of life, I showed you know, by hand, the tree of life, mm -hmm. that's, in, that's in the first book of Genesis. That's the tree of life that God told Adam and Eve they shouldn't take, eat the fruit of, and they did. And so they got kicked out of Eden. So as I say, it, 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 in so many respects, I want to say, here's another case, but Darwin doesn't think it's a biblical, tree of life he thinks it's it shows you the course of evolutionary history but he he's showing you the tree of life he's using the metaphor of the tree of life he's using this christian metaphor to illustrate the absolute fundamental nature of what evolution's all about so here's another case where i see continuity between darwin between christianity and darwinism you read darwin he talks about the tree of life and all of his readers would at once have said, oh, yes, I know about the tree of life. That makes sense. I understand what he's talking about. Yes, I can see that. Now, they may not accept it, but they understand what Darwin's doing because he's using metaphors, tropes from Christianity. So, so that's what I mean by saying Darwinism is a bastard offspring of Christianity. So thank you very much for your time. I think we... Uh, we uh, finished up that 15 extra 15 minutes that you generously gave us too. 
And uh, thanks so much for your time, Dr. Bruce. Okay, well, if you want to do it again, let me know. And I've said it now, so you're not in. If you ever want to get in touch with me, you won't be in my spam folder. Okay? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, then. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.